So hello, good afternoon. Please give a warm welcome to Mr. Juno Diaz. Thank you. As you might have mentioned, uh, Mr. Diaz is sitting in a very special armchair called the Buccaneist armchair. It actually, I was told, I've been told it fits 80 books. And my first question would be sort of unusual, whether uh, you feel comfortable sitting in a, such a specific, special armchair designed for the book lovers. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, I wanted to thank uh, Prague for having me, uh, everyone for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you for taking the time to be my interlocutor. And uh, to the question, I, I, I've had back surgery, so nothing feels comfortable anymore, you know? So I'm sure this is wonderful, but my back always hurts anyway, you know? <laughs> you know? All right, we'll try to do better next no, time. No, no, no. <laughs> I wish they designed the spine better, but they've not. All right. Okay, uh, Mr. Diaz, we'll start uh, with uh, reading a short excerpt from uh, uh, his short story called Monstro. Uh, and I would ask Mr. Diaz just to read a few pages for us before we start the discussion. Thank you. Um, I, I, nothing much to know. It's a, a story set in what kind of a genre nerds call the near future, you know? It's a, it's a few years from now, uh, set in the Dominican Republic that's gone to more hell than most of us are going to hell. And um, again, I, I basically write about dumb relationships all the time, that and dictators. So this is dumb relationships and neoliberal capitalism, which is another dictatorship. So that's it. Yeah. And our narrator, our protagonist, um, has been sent to the Dominican Republic to his family there uh, because his mother has become very sick. Yeah. So he's actually from the States. And um, here we go. Everybody at Brown knew Alex Ship. I think everybody in Providence knew him. The Negro was a star like that. This flash, privileged kid who looked more like a Uruguayan football player than a platano, with short, curly, Praetorian hair and machine-made cheekbones and about the greenest eyes you ever saw. Six foot eight and super full of himself. Through the sickest parties and always stepping out with the most romping girls. Drove an Eastwood for fuck's sake. But what I realized on the island was that Alex was more than just a rico. Turned out he was a fucking V son of the wealthiest, most privileged family on the island. His abuelo, like the 99th richest man in the Americas, while his abuela had more than 9,000 properties. At Brown, the Negro had actually been playing it modest, for good reason, too. It turned out when he was in middle school, he was kidnapped for eight long months and barely got out alive. Never talked about it, not even cryptically, but dude never left the house in DR unless he was packing fuego and always offered me a cannon too, like it was a piece of fruit or something, and said, just, you know, in case something happens. V or not, I had respect for Alex because he worked hard as fuck, not one of those upper class vividores who sat around and blew lax was doing philosophy at Brown and business at MIT, smashed like a 4-0 and still had time to do his photography thing. And like a lot of our laxters in the States, he really loved Santo Domingo. He never pretended he was Spanish or Italian or gringo, always claimed Dominican, and that ain't nothing, not the way platanos can be. For all his pluses, Alex could also be extra dickish. Always had to be the center of attention. I couldn't say anything slightly smart without him wanting to argue with me. 
And when you got him on a point, he huffed. Well, I don't know about that. He treated Dominican workers in restaurants and clubs and bars like they were lower than shit and never left any kind of tip. You have to yell at these people or they'll just walk over you was his whole thing. Yeah, right, Alex, I told him. And he grimaced. You're just a Naxalite. And you, I said, are a come solo, which he hated. Pretty much on his own, no sibling, and his family would as about as checked out as you could get. Had a dad who spent so much of his time abroad, the Lalex would have been lucky to pick him out of a lineup. And a mother who'd had more plastic surgery than all of Caracas combined, who flew out to Miami every week just to shop and fuck this Senegalese lawyer that everyone except his dad seemed to know about. Alex had a girlfriend from his social set he'd been dating since they were 12, Valentina, but he'd cheated on her at least 2,000 times with girls and boys. Because of his lacks, she wasn't going anywhere. And Dude told me about it too, as soon as he introduced me to her. What do you think of that, he asked, with a serious cheese on his face. Sounds pretty shitty, I said. Oh, come on, he said, putting an avuncular arm around me. It ain't that bad. Alex's big dream? Of course we all knew it, because he wouldn't shut up about all the plep he was going to do. He wanted to be either the Dominican Salgado or the Dominican Silva, minus the double amputation, naturally. He also wanted to write novels, make films, drop an album, be the star of his own channel on the world. Dude wanted to do everything. As long as it was arty and it made him a name, he was into it. He was also the one who wanted to go to Haiti to take pictures of all the infected people. Misty was like, you can go catch a plague all by yourself. But he waved her off and recited his motto, which was also on his cards, to represent to surprise, to cause, to provoke. To die, she added. He shrugged and smiled. A photographer has to be willing to risk it all. A photograph can change todo. You had to hand it to him. He had confidence and recklessness. I remember this time a farmer in Bani uncovered an exploded, unexploded bomb from the Civil War in his field. And Alex raced us all there and wanted to take a photo of Misty sitting on the device in a cheerleading outfit. And she was like, are you fucking insane? So he sat down on it himself while we crouched behind the burner. And he snapped his own picture, grinning like a loon, and got on the front page of the Listine with that antic. Parents flying in from their respective cities to have a chat with him. He really did think he could change todo. Me, I didn't want to change anything. I didn't want to be famous. I just wanted to write one book that was worth a damn, and I would have happily called it a day. Mi hermano, that is pathetic to an extreme, Alex said. You have to dream a lot bigger than that. Well, I certainly dreamed big with Misty. In those days, she was my Wonder Woman, my Queen of Haragua. But in the truth, but the truth is, I don't remember her as well as I used to. I don't have any pictures of her. They were all lost in the fall when the memory stacks blew, when La Capital was scoured. One thing a Negro wasn't going to forget, though, one thing that you didn't need photos for, was how beautiful she was, tall and copper-colored, an ex-volleyball player studying international law at Unibe with a cascade of black hair that could have woven 30 days of nights from. Some modeling when she was 13, 14 definitely on the receiving end of some skin crafting and bone crafting, maybe breasts, definitely ass, and who knows what else, but would have rather died than to cop to it. You better believe I'm pura lemba, she always said. And even I had to roll my eyes at that. Spent five years in Quebec before her mother finally dumped her asshole Canadian stepfather 
and dragged her screaming back to La Capital, something she still held against the Vieja, against the whole DR. She spoke impeccable French and used it every chance she got, always made a show of reading thick-ass French novels. And that was what she wanted once her studies were over, to move to Paris, to work for the UN, to read French books in a cafe. Me, oh, men love me in Paris, she announced. Like this might be a revelation. Men love you here, Alex said. Misty shook her head. It is not the same. Of course it's not the same, I said. Men shower in Santo Domingo and dance too. Have you ever seen Francesa's dance? It's like watching an epileptic convention. Misty spat an ice cube at me. French men are the best. Yes, she liked me well enough. Could even say we were friends. I had my charming in those days. I had a mouth on me like all the swords of the Montagues and Capulets combined, like someone had overdosed me with a truth serum. You're Alex's only friend who doesn't take his crap, she confided in me once. You don't even take my crap. Yeah, she liked me, but she didn't like me, entiendes? But God, did I love her. Now, I think probably about enough, yeah? It goes on in such a dreary fashion, but we'll leave it here, yeah? Thank you. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> I feel like it cut off all the parts that we were going to talk about, but you'll get it. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> so inevitably, my first question would be, how does the story end? How does it evolve and how does it end? Uh, yeah, I, 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 it's sort of a, a, a kind of a apocalyptic story where you have these kind of dumbass kids who are just doing what certain kinds of dumbass young people will do. They're sort of just chasing each other and kind of in some ways being frivolous while the world that they're living in, this island that's divided between the Dominican Republic and Haiti is completely collapsing and uh, a very strange infection has taken hold of the island. And they're just oblivious to it. It's like they're sort of clubbing and taking drugs while the world is ending and, and I guess the end of the story the world ends so <laughs> and they're so dumb they don't even notice it which is probably going to be my situation <laughs> did you have in mind any specific country or situation when you were writing monstro well, yeah I mean look again I, I don't know anyone here or where anyone is from but I'm sure you all had a sense that the planet is on a supremely apocalyptic trajectory while everyone is liking shit on Facebook, you know? And it's, it's a very strange place for us to be. And, and, and I think I'm not the only one who comments on this. Uh, you know, I, I teach at a university that's a technological university. It's um, MIT. And... My students are always pointing out, you know, that uh, folks are online, you know, protesting climate, you know, climate change and, you know, going really hard on social media about climate change. And my students point out that the, the infrastructure of our cell phones requires so much power and so much technology that... It's just strange that we're on the one hand on our social media being like, you know, climate change is real, but our phones are one of the leading causes of the reason we're in such a ravaged, terrifying state. And so these contradictions, I think if you're kind of a, I don't know, just a, a, a 50 year old artist seem interesting. <laughs> um, they probably wouldn't have seemed interesting to me when I was 25. Maybe they're too obvious. But it's, it's, it's kind of fascinating. It's the endless, you know, fiddle while Rome burns. But the fiddling has gotten very strange. 
And so you try to track the fiddling. And I, I kind of, again, I know this is silly, but uh, if you're from the Dominican Republic or Haiti, that island has been the site of so many apocalypses. Um, it is such an apocalyptic place. I would argue that the apocalypse is the default Caribbean experience. <laughs> and so basically I feel like I'm writing in the genre that I was weaned on. Um, even if I didn't do it too well, it's sort of like dancing. You got to try to get better. So, you know, just give it a shot. Do people in the Caribbean still perceive the USA as a country of hope and bright future? Do they... Do they perceive, do they see the USA, the USA. As, a country, as a country of bright future? I mean, when you're broke as shit, anyone with money looks like a possibility. And, you know, because of the, the sort of profound inequality and the profound, you know, economic cruelties of our neoliberal capital order, places like the Dominican Republic predominantly, you know, are, suffer enormous poverty. Mm -hmm. And so when you have that kind of inequality, a place like the United States, just as an abstraction and as a projected image, can seem very enticing. The reality is very different. I mean, part of being from a very poor Dominican family who immigrated to the United States under the illusion that it was going to be this bright future is that even though I've experienced the reality, which for the community of immigrants isn't always bright, I'll be honest, desperate poverty is not always interested in the news we bring. I will tell my cousins 24-7 that coming to the United States is incredibly difficult when you're poor. And they'll say, well, shit's difficult here. And then when they immigrate, and this has happened to me repeatedly, <laughs> when they immigrate, they are always mad at me. They're like, why didn't you tell me? And I was like, actually, I did try, but the United States and the gap the inequality gap between a place like the United States and the Dominican Republic for the majority of the people we're talking about is almost incommunicable. Mm -hmm. There's nothing, none of my writing, none of my affection and my connections with my siblings can breach, can bridge that gap. So, yeah, a lot of people still think that, you know, that the first world is going to be the answer to the problems. And then if you get one or two people who hit the lottery, people think, well, fuck it. I'm going to be you. I'm not going to be like all your cousins who, you mm -hmm. know, ended up being killed at their jobs or ended up deported or ended up depressed and broken because it's so difficult to maintain yourself in these very hostile anti-immigrant conditions. So it's almost, you know, this, if you got nothing, you got nothing to lose mentality. And that it's very difficult to imagine another world. I think this is why we're so endlessly, eagerly imagining other worlds in our literature and in our film because we want to imagine other worlds. Uh -huh. But it's very, very difficult. Even if you love someone tremendously, how do you communicate to a person that you care about, that you have a profound intimacy with what a world that you've experienced is. It's so difficult. It's so hard. And uh, so, you know, th that's part of it, yeah? I think, I think that's part of it. But then again, you, as an author, as a writer, you still comment on the current situation. So my next question would be, what would your character, Junior, say about the current situation in the USA? I mean, you know, I have this narrator who appears in almost all my works. And again, I, I, I have to tell you, if anyone here, an artist at all, any? Are you not participating? This side has got all the artists. There's no artists on that side? Shit. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, the thing about being an artist is that... Um, 
especially when you're a literary artist, is that it's actually easy to write people who are smarter than you, right? You just look shit up and put it in their mouths and suddenly they're smarter than you. So, you know, I have this alter ego who's a lot smarter than me and a lot more radical than me politically, even though I'm hard to the left in certain respects. Uh, I, I mean, I would assume that this character that I've written for so long uh, is as appalled, or would be as appalled as I am. Uh, the thing about living in a country like the United States as an immigrant is that you always think you have reached the bottom of the United States is malevolence towards immigrant, towards people of African descent, towards poor people. You always think that you've reached the limit. And then the country surprises you with this new bottom, this new extremity, this new set of cruelty. Uh, look, I, I, I think that it's very easy, and I am eager to do it, to say that Donald Trump is this colophone of all that's wrong with the country, right? But the truth of it is, is that there is a lot of people on the left and on the right and in the center who pay lip service to the rights of immigrants but really don't give two fucks about them. That they ain't gonna stop their day for it. And that in fact, even as they're attacking Trump for his anti-immigrant politics, they themselves will express all sorts of anti-immigrant ideologies. And, you know, we're in a tough situation, whether we're in Europe or in the United States or in the Dominican Republic. The planetary zeitgeist has turned against immigrant communities. You don't need to be a genius to know that the way that our economic order has gotten people to blame immigrants for their economic precarity. This is global conditions. It's so much easier to blame the weak than it is to attack who needs to be attacked, which are our elites. And so in the Dominican Republic, the Dominican Republic is vilely anti-immigrant. Vilely anti-immigrants. The only thing you need the only transition when I come from Santo Domingo to the United States, as far as the anti-immigration politics, is change the names. In the Dominican Republic, it's anti-Haitian and Haitian-Dominican. In the United States, it's anti-Latino, anti-Asian, anti-Muslim, etc. And it, this is a condition that implicates us all. Even as the left and the right argue in the United States, the anti-immigrant politics marches on. In fact, this left and right, what we call this polarization, has been so useful for anti-immigrant politics. While the left and right argue against each other, the lives of immigrants is eroded, their rights are undermined, and the country becomes acclimatized to a new normal of inhuman cruelty towards immigrants. And we'll get rid of Trump one day, but the regime he set up will outlast him and be naturalized because so many of us have accepted this anti-immigrant regime without really asking ourselves, hey, why was it so easy for this dumbass to get elected? Mm -hmm. Well, it was easy because my dude came off the first day saying Mexicans are drug dealers and rapists. And that is a very common belief among many people in the United States, even if they disavow it. It is a vile belief, but it's very common. Mm -hmm. Okay. Two years ago, uh, Chuck Polanyk was here, and he was speaking about trends in modern American fiction, and he, find, he defined three different branches. One of them was techno-modernism, with the authors like Thomas Pynchon or David Foster Wallace, 
The other, another was, you know, this dirty realism with the likes of Raymond Carver, and then multicultural plural, pluralism with minority literatures, where he actually specifically mentioned your name. So my question would be, do you agree with that division, and do you feel like a part of, you know, multicultural pluralism with minority literatures? I guess my question is, where did Chuck put himself? Uh, well, he actually, uh, that's, that's a very interesting thing. I don't think he classified himself as any of those three. That's useful. Boxes. That's very useful. Uh, I actually almost find, I, I actually don't really believe that is useful. Um, look, any partition of something as ungraspable as literary canon is, I would argue, profoundly, clearly profoundly political, right? But also perhaps myopically political. Um, I'm sure you read an enormous amount. Well, that's a yes. Better. Yeah. It used to be better, yeah. Well, it's always better. But I'm sure you read an enormous amount. It used to be better for me. I read an enormous amount. I, I'll reveal how much I read because my Kindle keeps track of it. I read, on bad weeks, I read two books a week. Yeah, that's bad weeks. On good weeks, I'll read four books a week. I consider myself a high-level reader. I have not even approached 0.1% of the novels published in America. I have no idea how one could divide a literature that you have not read. Now, if some of you have read every novel published over the last 40 years, I would love to hear what you think is going on. I can tell you if people are asking how do I think of myself into what tradition, I'm, I might not look it. One thing about being in Prague is I'm always, everyone thinks I'm Moroccan, which is great, you know. <laughs> uh, but I'm actually a person of African descent, yeah, on both sides of my family. Uh, and I see myself in the sort of literary stream of the Caribbean, African diasporic letters, uh, you know, the Latin, Latin American community, you know, Latinx literature. Yeah, I'm from New Jersey. I think of myself as New Jersey. For me, I just think that that kind of partition with Passe Chuck, you know, with apologies to Chuck, I'm sure he meant something a little bit, I'm, I'm assuming he meant something a little bit more nuanced, but the problem with that partition is that it seems to deny what's really true about any artist is endless simultaneity. That you are multiple things at any given moment. That there are writers who are multicultural pluralists who do dirty realism and techno-futurism and 30 other things besides. <laughs> um, and so I, I don't know, I, I, I think of myself in that, but you must remember, and I'm sure you all know, that the question of how one defines themselves as an artist is an endless and ongoing debate. All of you have lived long enough to know that um, people spend all day trying to put you into a box. They're not doing it only because they're cruel, you know, but people tend to be very shorthand. They're like, you're this, you're that, and you keep thinking, I am more than a mother, I am more than a father, I am more than a partner, I am more than a literary writer. Our simultaneity and the endlessness of our identity is a far better definition of who we are than any of the categories that we've come up with, which, which are, I would argue, reductive. If a category doesn't permit more options, it's reductive. And so a category should 
open up the possibility for more. So that's how I think of it. Hopefully when I'm dead, people will at least be like, <laughs> you know, one hopes they will at least be like, this motherfucker was from New Jersey, this motherfucker was Dominican. Like, you just want that. That's my dream. But you probably won't get that. In the future, they'll be like, he was in some sort of weird chromosome that they're going to be thinking <laughs> is the key identity. Who knows? The future has its own uses for the present, which none of us can divine. Well, Monstro is set in the future, uh, in very near future, and it's not a bright one. And there's a song by a German alternative band called Einsturz in the Neubauten, where uh, they claim that if future isn't bright, well, at least it's colorful. <laughs> Would you agree? In the Caribbean, that's definitely true. <laughs> Allow me to say of all the kind of ridiculous stereotypes about the island I'm from, I, I will at least on the face accept we're very colorful. Just literally, there's a lot of color. Um, it's an interesting thing, yeah. Uh, because, you know, one of the, the claims that... Uh, gets attributed to Jameson, but it's been kind of hard to see if Jameson's the one who really said this exactly. It's this idea that, you know, um, people's inability to imagine the end of capital is the reason people are always trying to imagine these kind of dark futures. I've, I've already butchered it, as usual. Um, I just think, you know, our writing about the future is to write about the present and every generation prides itself in being in a very dire place and certainly you don't become a literary artist because you want to be a cheerleader of blandishments and narratives of consolation you become a literary artist because you're trying to express things that the general society disavows and part of what the general society tends to disavow are a lot of the violent cruelties and what lies beneath the sort of banal cheerfulness of bourgeois society, among other things. I think our future, you don't need to be a scientist to know. Humanity's future is looking very troubled indeed. You know, if you're rich as shit, it's looking real bright in this system. But for the rest of us, it's looking very, very dire. Whether we're interested in incorporating that into our sense of ourselves and our sense of our communities in a way that doesn't demotivate us and depress us, but invites new forms of civic engagement, is, that's still up in the air. Yeah, I don't think looking at a glass or a coffee cup and pointing out that the coffee cup is broken is a negative thing. In America, if you point out that something is broken, you're considered negative. Where in the Dominican Republic, if you point out that something is broken, in the general, <laughs> you are considered somebody who wants to fix a coffee cup. <laughs> And I would argue that that sensibility, I wish we could get that sensibility more prevalent. That just because we point out that shit is fucked up doesn't mean you're negative. That actually, for me, that's the highest form of optimism because you're arguing that things m could possibly be fixed. People who need to lie about this thing being broken to keep their cheerfulness going are not optimists. That's not optimism. Optimism is being able to see something broken and saying, we can fix this, not pretending the thing isn't broken. So that's the way I'm thinking, you know? So the motto of this festival, of this year's edition, is beauty will save the world. And for Junior, uh, at the end of this short story, Monstro, uh, beauty actually stands behind his possible end because he decides to stay 
uh, in the Dominican Republic for Misty, for the love of his life, even though he knows that um, the apocalypse is actually coming. So do you really think that beauty will save the world? Yeah. And I don't mean to like, you know how authors are always trying to make their shit seem more interesting than it is? <laughs> I, forgive me. I, I also think this character doesn't leave the Dominican Republic while the apocalypse is coming because he's basically lazy. As he says, he's like, I don't want to change anything, you know? Um, I mean, with that said, look, I'm a big Lord of the Rings person. I find Lord of the Rings very interesting for all of its problems, of all of its faults. I find it very interesting. And there's a moment in Lord of the Rings for the people who don't know this book. It's a fantasy novel. There's a moment in this fantasy novel where the main female, there's only like three female characters in the whole book, but one of the female characters uh, is offered this ring of great power. And she says, ah, yes, if you give me that ring, you know, if you give me that ring, I will be this glorious, beautiful tyrant. All will love me and despair. And I never forgot that. Beauty can be mobilized by the forces of horror quite as easily as beauty can be mobilized by, quote-unquote, people who want to make this a more just world. For me, it depends on what we talk about. Um, in my mind, what is beautiful is solidarity. Yeah? An ethos of solidarity, where instead of an ethos of the executioner or the prosecutor, right, or the exploiter, an ethos of solidarity. That's very, very beautiful. That's not where we are in this country. I mean, the country where I'm, the countries where I'm from. Solidarity is being undermined from every corner. Everyone's being told to fight each other. And we all have good reasons, supposedly, to fight each other. But if anything has happened in the last 20 years is that what we precisely need, solidarity, is the very thing that's been undermined in every single sector, in every single community. For me, that's a great beauty, solidarity. That could save the world. Mm -hmm. But beauty, just as an aesthetic attract, I, I think the fact that we all can fall for the aesthetic lure is part of the reason we always have to be on guard for the ways that people in power use aesthetic drugs to addict us. The truth is, we have all of us very strange concepts of what's attractive. And let me tell you, neoliberal capital has your number. Whatever the hell you think is cute, capital's got your number. And it's got a really nice fish hook for all of us to throw ourselves on. I would think that we must always be on guard for our love of beauty and try to figure out ways to disrupt the ability for people in power to use what we find attractive as a way to further encage us. And that's why, you know, loving things that people in power don't like is really great. What do they don't like? Well, people in power don't like solidarity. And they don't like compassion. People in power don't want you to be compassionate. They want you to want to kill each other. They want you to judge each other. They want you to draw lines in the sand and say, beyond this line, nothing. But let me tell you, you get people who have solidarity and compassion at their heart of all their politics, every prince and every tower and every corporate headquarter and every tyrant will lose sleep. Twitter makes no tyrant lose sleep. None. Has anyone has seen the way that all of these governments have weaponized social media against 
their civil rights activists you now. So, I mean, in my sense, I believe we can save ourselves, but I would argue that we need to find beauty in things that we are being encouraged not to. And among the many things we're being encouraged not to think of as beautiful, solidarity and compassion. The current state of it is, of our lives, is Hobbesian. Always mistrust every other community, always assume every other community is out to exploit and harm you, have no compassion towards anyone, and the wealthy and the truly cruel sleep well. And they have not lost a night of sleep these last 20 years, I'll tell you that. If I was, if I was an incredibly rich, powerful person, these last 20 years have been so good. <laughs> these have been amazing years for power because everybody has turned into a prison warden. Everybody is like, fuck solidarity and fuck compassion. And as Kurosawa said, the bad sleep well. Okay, to end on a more optimistic note. Shoot, that's optimistic. <laughs> uh, and my wrap-up question would be whether uh, we can be looking forward to more juniors uh, adventures uh, either in the DR or somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, I'm like a... And whether it's going to be in the present or in the future? Yeah. I... Um... I'm a published writer who gets invited to literary festivals like Prague, uh, very prestigious, wonderful events, but I actually suck at writing. <laughs> In other words, I write incredibly slowly. It takes me decades to write a book. Um, I hope I stay alive to finish my next book, but since it takes me like, now it's, we're gonna head towards 15 years, it takes me a long time to write a book, so I don't know. Maybe? I think about my grandfather, you know, my grandfather, un campesino de asua, un señor muy, muy humilde. And he said to me, he's like, in English, he said to me, take a shit in one hand and put your plans in the other <laughs> and let me know which one has more worth. <laughs> And I was like, damn, abuelo, I am six years old, yo. <laughs> Fuck. These old timers, man. They never had age-appropriate wisdom. So I want to. I hope my plans, I hope my plans are worth more than a turd. But you never know. Well, we wish you all the great luck to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.